The Model Shop Live Scale Modeling Show is brought to you by Tenet Controls, makers of lighting kits, soundboards, and more. Tenet Controls brings your models to life. And by HDA Model Works, suppliers of scale model lighting products, detail parts, and complete model kits. Visit HDAModelWorks.com today. Well, hello there again, everybody. Boyd with you, and welcome to episode 115 of the Model Shop Live Scale Modeling Show. We're coming to you from our shop here in San Antonio, Texas. we got a great show in store for you guys tonight. Uh, before we kick everything off tonight, I just want to say a uh, quick reminder to everybody uh, to think of all the people out there who are in the path of these uh, hurricanes that we've had the last couple weeks. We had Hurricane Harvey come through, and now we've got Irma down there in Florida. So... Uh, or I think it's Irma or Ira, one of the two, but uh, everybody keep the people down there in their thoughts. I just wanted to say a thank you to all the uh, well-wishers from a couple weeks ago when we had the hurricane come through here. We were just fine here. We were, uh, I'm quite a bit uh, inland here in Texas. I'm up in about the central part of Texas. We got a little bit of rain, a little bit of wind, but uh, not too bad. But the people over there in Houston are really having a hard time. So uh, if you can help, I uh, appreciate if you guys uh, help in any way you can and just keep everybody in your thoughts. So. But we've got a great show in store tonight. We're going to um, do a little bit of uh, work on the bench. I had a lot of requests come in uh, from people that watch the uh, TrekWorks channel about how to set up uh, a sound card. So a lot of modelers out there now are adding sounds to their uh, model displays. So we're going to take one of these little uh, big dogs uh, sound display card or sound cards and uh, put it on the bench and take you through the whole process of how you basically uh, track down the sounds you're looking for, how you edit them, and how you load them, load them onto the uh, sound card, and then set the sound, cup, sound card up to work with your model, or actually make it uh, produce some lighting effects along with the sound. So I hope that'll uh, uh, help answer some of the questions out there for some people who have been asking about that. We got a, a kit review for you guys tonight. We got, I just got this um, 1350 scale um, USS Indianapolis uh, uh, from Academy Models that I got a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to be building this one up here pretty soon on my TrekWorks channel. Uh, there was some big news recently where they discovered the wreck of this ship. A lot of people have been looking for it for a long time. I think, you know, well, obviously over 70 years. And uh, Paul Allen's team, the Microsoft co-founder who does a lot of uh, deep, deep sea exploration, they found the ship a couple of weeks ago. And we're expecting here shortly to have a, uh, I guess on his YouTube channel, he's going to put a live... Uh, underwater uh, kind of presentation of the whole thing so that everybody can watch and I'm really fascinated and looking forward to seeing that I'm 
really into deep sea wrecks, especially warships and stuff like that. And uh, so that should be pretty cool to follow along with. Hope you guys are enjoying the weekend here. We had the kickoff of the NFL here in the States. We've got the Orville uh, show premiering tonight. I'm uh, missing it right now, but I'm recording it so I can watch it later. I'm uh, just watch a few clips from the show, and it looks to be really funny. And uh, hopefully it'll be a nice little uh, treat for us Star Trek fans. they got a lot of Star Trek references in that. And then in a couple weeks, we got Discovery that's going to premiere, so some really cool stuff coming on. Um, before we get going here, I wanted to say a couple of... Uh, uh, YouTube shout outs, YouTube channel shout outs. I wanted to shout out to, um, let's see, we've got SMKR scale model kit review. That's Steve Sutton over there. He's uh, on a drive right now to raise some subscribers on his channel. And uh, I'm subscribed uh, to Steve's channel myself. I've been a subscriber for quite a while. And uh, Steve does a great job over there. He, he does a lot of scale model kit reviews and uh, really nice builds. He's participating in our uh, Halloween group build this year. So hop over to Steve's channel and check it out. He does uh, He'll usually have the latest and greatest model kits. He does a great job laying them out on the bench and uh, Going through them in detail so you can uh, check those kits out before you buy them and see if you're interested or not And then we've got our very own uh, Tagamo model works tag out there who is a member of our community uh, tag has uh, uh, been he just you know, he, he kind of does um his videos aren't like done like every week and everything like that, but he tries to update them pretty regularly. But he does some fantastic work on his channel, and he takes you through uh, his model builds that he's working on step by step, and uh, gives a lot of building tips and painting tips along the way. So that's a good channel to subscribe to. He just recently up, uh, uploaded a video of the uh, one six scale Batgirl figure that he finished the resin kit, and it turned out beautiful. And he he takes you through the whole thing about how he. Uh, uh, all the work he did on that kit. He did some in interesting techniques with applying some glitter onto Batgirl's costume, which really came out fantastic. So you can check that out. And uh, another one of our very own, Chuck Brooks, who operates a YouTube uh, channel, uh, Gearhead Workshop. Chuck's just kind of new to the YouTube community. He's been putting out videos now for about a year or so, and uh, he's getting going over there. He does a really good job as well, uh, uh, posting videos and um, showing you the step-by-step -step build process and talks about how he does it and everything. Works on a lot of car kits and he uh, participates in a lot of the uh, uh, group builds that are out there. So check out Chuck's channel. And then I want to say a shout out to Kenny at Mindless Model Works. Kenny's a good friend of ours and uh, Kenny uh, is uh, constantly doing things out there to keep the community interesting. He's putting together lots and lots of group builds. I just participated in his Halloween group build for this year. Built a little pirate ship and then uh, He's got the cancer awareness uh, group build going on right now. That's an important build to keep that uh, keep that uh, thought in everybody's minds out there. A lot of people suffer from cancer, and I'm going to uh, take part in that as well. So hop over to Kenny's channel. You can always uh, join in on one of the group builds. Everybody's welcome. Not a lot of rules, so Kenny keeps it fun. And uh, check it out, guys. So let's see a couple other a couple other little notes I had for tonight here. Uh, okay, we're going to hop over to. Um, Hopefully I can do this without uh, messing it up. It's always a risky business. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. We're going to hop over to our uh, modeling community. And um, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Of course, we got our Halloween group build going on uh, this year. And I just wanted to uh, take you guys through the page here a little bit and um, show you what's going on. We got Mark Shu here at the top. Uh, who's working on the Herman Munster kit. I don't know if he's doing the Grandpa kit too, but he's got the Herman Munster kit here. So let's check out what he's doing. He's painting his base there and uh, starting to work on the uh, details. He's got all the parts of uh, Herman Munster going together here, got them primed. All these figure kits, you know, you got to do a little bit of uh, puttying on the seams and everything, so it takes a little while to get them prepped and all that, but it looks like he's coming along. I think that likeness of uh, Fred Gwynn, the original Herman Munster, is really well done on this kit too. So you can see he's going through and getting those uh, parts ready to go. Go back here and uh, shout out to Mike Kovach. He's one of our uh, community members living down there in Florida. He's giving us an update on uh, what the hurricane's doing down there. So stay safe, Mike. I hope you're uh, doing okay. He's probably not on with us tonight. Probably having a hard time with some uh, power lines and stuff like that down there. So stay safe and dry, Mike. Hope you and your family are doing all right. And then we've got uh, the Jordy Modeler, who uh, he's one of the uh, people that uh, is part of our community, and he's got his Halloween group build uh, kit already finished. This is a witch kit, and uh, he's taken some really nice photographs of this. You can see he did a really nice job on the uh, 
overall detail of this model. Beautiful work on the uh, figure. Love the uh, detail down here on the uh, patches on the uh, apron. Even the half uh, full bottle of, uh, that might be what they call down south elixir, otherwise known as moonshine or whiskey. <laughs> Got the old cauldron going there, some flames. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. A couple different views of it here. Did a great job on the face and everything. As you can see too, guys, when you're a little bit later this uh, next month, when everybody starts getting their kits finished up, it's important to uh, try to take some really good pictures of it. You know, get your camera set on a tripod or kind of get it somewhere where you can hold it still and take some nice, um, clear and focused pictures of it. And uh, if you got lighting, maybe turn the lights down a little bit so we can see that really good. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have uh, the cutoff for set submitting your pictures this year is on the 28th of October. So that gives me time to um, get all the uh, pictures gathered up, and I'll put them in a slideshow. And that way we can do a nice slideshow presentation uh, every year, like we do every year, and highlight everybody's work and give, give everybody a nice shout-out and let the community see the whole thing all in one, all in one place. That'll be pretty fun to do. Okay, so that's that one. Good job, Jordy Modeler. Thanks for submitting the pictures, and thanks for taking part. We got uh, Murphy Peoples here, who we haven't seen in a while. Glad to see you back, Murphy and Grayson. They're uh, regular members of our community. Murphy's working on the uh, uh, Land of the Giants Spindrift. It's an old uh, sci-fi TV show that used to be on, and uh, he's working on scratch building the seats for the interior of the ship, and you can see this looks awesome. Really nice job there, Murphy. Looks like he might have started off with some um, seats out of a fighter jet or something like that, and he's starting to add his own little detail to make them look more like the seat should. I think he mentions here he's modified a, a, a Steve McQueen Le Mans figure to represent one of the figures that we saw on the uh, television show. So some really nice work coming together there. And then we have uh, Dennis Statler posted his uh, uh, Batmobile that he worked on for our 48-hour community build. Uh, Dennis was one of the guys that was on our live hangout that night we broadcast. Had a good time with that. We're going to be doing more of those in the future with our group builds. And uh, the classic 66 Batmobile looks like it turned out really nice, Dennis. Always love that kit. Got all the details on there. Good going, Dennis, and thanks for sharing that with us. Got Dan Harris, who's working on the Michael Myers Halloween uh, figure kit from, uh, I believe that's, I can't read that down there, if that's Polar Lights or Mobius. I think it's Mobius. Uh, it, that seems to be a popular uh, kit this year for Halloween groups builds. I know there's a couple of people uh, working on that. Let's see if he's got any pictures of uh, progress he's making with it. Yep, he's got the uh, jumpsuit here. He's explaining that it had quite a few seams in it, and he had to do quite a bit of putty work to get it cleaned up. Cleaning up the hands here. Nothing unusual for building models. You just have to uh, develop those skills if you're new to it. Just a little bit of sanding and uh, use of putty to fill all those little imperfections in and get them smoothed out, and you'll have it looking really nice. And uh, moving on down here, let's see. We've got... Uh, James Pike, who talks about uh, just uh, returning to modeling uh, from, a, from a break for a while, and now he's working on that new 12700 scale Star Destroyer kit, starting to do some fiber optic lighting on that. Got uh, Justin Gibb, who's uh, worked on a nice little diorama here. PJC, who's got the uh, Dukes of Hazard Ghost of the General Lee that he's going to be doing for the... Uh, Halloween group building. Looks like he's getting started on it there. T. Commando. He's got an um, interesting Halloween project. He's going to be building the uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea Sea View, and there was an episode called The Phantom where the Sea View encountered a ghostly World War I U-boat, and the ghost of the ship, the captain of the ship, kind of came and haunted the crew there a little bit, so that definitely qualifies for Halloween. Really looking forward to seeing that one come together.
and uh, Clint Llewellyn. I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of Clint because Clint has uh, uh, done a good job learning how to paint figures. He's uh, hasn't done a whole lot of those in the past, and he's been starting to try his hand at, at doing some of these. Uh, here a while back, he did the uh, dragon from the original Dragon Slayer movie and did a fantastic job on that. Now here he's working with the creature from the Black Lagoon. He was uh, on the community here for the last few days asking some questions about the uh, paint color choices, and it looks like he's got it all worked out really nice. Creature's looking really good. Really love that uh, background shot there too, Clint. It looks just like he came straight out of the movie. That's really a nice job. And we got Heath Tompkins, one of our regulars here too, who's going to be building the uh, Knight Rider 2000. Always a really cool kit to build. And let's see, we've got our good friend Chris Cortell from Classic Plastic 101. That's another great YouTube channel. Chris is doing the Ghost of the Castle Mare, and let's have a look at this. Just a beautiful job. You can you can head over to Chris's YouTube channel and see his video updates on this kit. He's doing some fantastic work on it. He's got the uh, logo here on the back wall lit up with some really cool multicolor changing LEDs and the uh, the face and the chest are going to light up on this uh, figure here. I think he's mentioned he's going to have some lighting coming out on various points on the backdrop but you can see Chris is an awesome painter and he's got some really beautiful um, dry brushing techniques and stuff going on here for putting together the uh, uh, backdrop that comes with this kit and he added some extra details here with some uh, weeds and stuff uh, that you can pick up at your local hobby store for pretty cheap and make your kits uh, bring up the detail quite a bit so Chris talks about all that stuff on his videos so thanks for sharing that with us Chris that one's looking great Let's see what else we can find here looks like PJC is also doing the uh, Mike Myers kit Mike Kovach is uh, doing the uh, Adam 12, so he's taken a uh, 68 Roadrunner body and he's uh, recast it. He, he made a new mold off of the original kit body, and you can follow him at his channel too. That's uh, uh, Mike, Mike uh, Kovach Industries, I think he calls his channel. Uh, and he takes you through how he did the mold and everything. So he's making a two-door into a four-door, and it's a tribute to the old Adam 12 TV show. So it looks like that's coming along pretty good. He's basically showing you some of the stuff he's doing here, scribing some new lines in the body, and uh, got it coming along pretty nice. So thanks for sharing that, Mike, and uh, Mike's another channel that I'm subscribed to on YouTube. And let's see, we'll slide on down here a little further. And we've got our friend Kenny Conklin from Sci-Fi Fantasy, who's also... Uh, participating in a Halloween group build and he's got uh, the Mike Myers kit here and he's uh, got the front porch part of the model here and then he's actually gonna uh, construct the front facade of the Myers house out of some wood so you can check that out on the sci-fi fantasy channel another YouTube channel that I follow uh, and Kenny talks about what he's doing on that that's a really interesting project he's got going there uh, David Brickley with his uh, 12500 scale star uh, Star Trek ships he's been working on. Looks like he's got the Excelsior here and a few other ones. Let's have a look at some of these. Hey, he's got a nice little collection going on there. Got the Enterprise D, the original Enterprise, the A, and now uh, I think that's the I think that's the oh that's the Enterprise B. Excuse me. So he's kind of focusing on the Enterprise. They all look beautiful. Aussie Trekkie talking about his uh, stash. He just got. Added some model kits to his stash here. Kenworth tractor kit. I'm jealous of that 1350 scale Enterprise CV6 kit there, Scott. I'm going to have to get one of those. That's one I've been uh, having on my build list. A uh, nice tribute to the Enterprise. And John Hunt with his uh, 12700 Star Destroyer. He's been keeping us updated on that with all the fiber optic work he's got going on there. Looks gorgeous. I've got that kit here myself, and I'm looking forward to getting started on that one pretty soon. And our good friend Cal Sweet, who is Halloween, uh, he's participating in the Halloween group build. These are the kits that he's going to be working on. These are all really fun. Barnabas, the Hex Marks the Spot. Hex Marks the Spot I just finished up myself, and I want to say that's a really, really fun kit to work on. You can uh, 
what I really like about that kit is that you can just add so much of your own imagination to it. They give you plenty of room to work with, and even if you just build it straight out of the box, it's just a really cool kit. Part of the original uh, Pirates of the Caribbean line of kits that were out like 40 years ago. They got really expensive and really hard to find, and now uh, it sounds like uh, round two is going to repop all those kits, so I'm looking forward to that. And the Strange Change Vampire, that's also a fun kit. I've got that one here I'm going to be doing myself, so looking forward to those, Cal. Cal also posted a picture of a model he built a few years ago of the Constellation, looking pretty good. And we got Lee Chambers with an update here on the uh, War of the Worlds build he's going to be doing. He picked up a vacuum. Whoops, picked up a vacuform kit uh, that's a larger scale than the Pegasus kit. Let's see, maybe he'll have a picture of it here. And some basic assembly instructions. Cobra head going on. Knowing Lee, I'm sure he's going to be doing some lighting on it. Oh, you, cool! You get the Martian figure with it. That's neat. Got the little hatch that can op be opened up on the bottom. Um, you can see there's the body of it. Looks like it's pretty good sized. There's a scale reference with some Tamiya paint. Oh yeah, nice looking kit. I didn't know that the alien had legs though. <laughs> but I guess he does now. But that's pretty neat. Looks like you get the little probe there too. And all that cool stuff. Very interesting kit. And the Tenet Controls Martian War Machine. You know we always like to see those Tenet Controls being used. Ralph over there is a good friend of ours. Sponsors our channel. So let's see. We're down here. Uh, let's see what else we got going on, guys. As you can see, it's a uh, Nice group of people here on this page. Uh, everybody's busy and everybody's helping each other out and lots of activity going on. There's a hex marks a spot that I finished up this week. I got pictures of that on there if you guys want to check that out. Um, got Paul Reese doing the Grim Reaper Chopper, which is a really awesome kit. Built that way back in the day myself and the Invisible Man. I was teasing Paul there a little bit on our uh, forum that if he he builds the invisible man he'll have to we'll just have to take his word for it because of course he's invisible we won't be able to see him um, and see Jim Clark's doing the Munsters polar lights I think this is the Munsters living room which is a kit that I would love to get and build myself sometime maybe I'll do that for next year's Halloween build that's always a really cool kit got Paul Reese also that just finished up his uh, Terminator Hunter Killer Tank. That's an awesome kit from Pegasus. Uh, Heath Tompkins, our good friend from uh, Australia Down Under, doing his very first NASCAR kit. And I told him, he got to be careful. NASCAR is addictive, Heath. <laughs> You'll get hooked on it. He's doing the uh, uh, Kevin Harvick, Jimmy Johns Ford Fusion there. So that's a current car that, he, that he's racing in NASCAR. So that's pretty cool. Got... Uh, Good friend of ours, Matt Alkire, who just uh, finished up his. Uh, I know Matt's been working on this kit a long time. When you look at these pictures, you'd you'd think it was the 1350 scale Enterprise refit, but this this is actually the old AMT 1537 kit. And as most of you know, it takes a lot of work to make one of these kits look good because there's so many problems with it, and uh, it just shows you why it took Matt a while to uh, to finish it because he went in and basically. Uh, cleaned up all that uh, you know these kits come with that rough molded uh, Aztec paneling on there and he went in there and cleaned up a lot of that and then uh, just did a really nice job with the Aztec decals and all the lights and everything and got it looking really spiffy like I said it's pretty hard to tell that it's not the 350 kit so that's a that's a job well done man it's hard to make that kit look good we used to be happy with it back in the day but uh, it's a little outdated now, so hats off, Matt, and thanks for sharing that with us. Give it a little time to refresh here, and let's go down. Let's see.
John Hunt with his uh, Star Wars diorama. Really cool lighting on this kit, as you can see. I'm not going to click this because this is actually a video. I don't think it'll play on here right now. But uh, you got the Stormtrooper there, and you got Darth Vader coming through the uh, bulkhead. And I love how they got the lighting around the edge here of the door like it's red hot and some blaster hits going on and all that. Just shows you what you can do with your imagination and a little bit of lighting techniques. You can really make these models pop. Lighting's probably one of the biggest reasons that brought me back to modeling a few years ago. I didn't uh, know that all that was going on out there. and Just do a little research and, and uh, learning a little bit. And you can learn how to do this yourself if you haven't started it already or tried it before. Got John Smith with the Klingon Katinga here. Looks like this is a video again, but you can see the picture there. He's got some nice lighting on that one. David Hale working on a... Uh, looks like this is a kit bash of... The Enterprise C. Let's see what he's got going on here. Yeah, he's doing some, uh, uh, making it into a different version of a starship. Some modifications on the pylons there, and how the saucer sits on the secondary hull. That looks pretty cool. Looks like he's a kind of an ongoing project there. And Gary Jacquard just wanted to say uh, congratulations to Gary. I know Gary's been. Uh, Posting updates here, and he was proud to announce that he finally finished up his 1350 scale classic Enterprise. And good on you, Gary. That's a beautiful kit. It looks like he did a wonderful job on it. Let's have a few looks at the pics here. Yeah, he's got some shuttle bay detail going on there. Got the impulse engines lit up real nice, and a little bit of weathering. Beautiful job on the detail on the bridge. Some uh, crew figures in there. A nice lit up engine bassards. Really nice job, Gary. It's not an easy kit to build, and you did a great job on it, so congratulations. Now you can take on the Enterprise refit next. And sorry, we went back to the top of the page here again, guys. It doesn't seem to work. This browser update thing that I have keeps getting stuck, and if I try to change it here, it kind of screws up my uh, broadcaster thing that I'm using, so it's the only way I can... My apologies for that. We'll get back down to the bottom here and just check out a little bit more. Kenny Conklin's got uh, his Model of the Year contest going on again uh, for 2018, but the entries are already coming in, so uh, another reason to stop by over at the Sci-Fi uh, uh, sci Fantasy page. And uh, if you've got a kit you want to enter this year, you have to be a member of that group. Uh, and go ahead and enter your kit. Just take some really good pictures of it. Kenny's got guidelines over there as far as how to cha uh, how to take your pictures and uh, what category you want to put it in. Kenny's got some different rules this year. So make sure you read all that before you post anything over there. Uh, and our very own Grayson Peoples. Grayson, we haven't seen you in a little while. I know you've probably been busy with school and everything, but she's decided to uh, get in on our group build this year for Halloween. So what better kit to pick than Christine one of my personal favorites, and uh, can't wait to see that one coming together. Her dad says he's going to get her a lighting kit for it, so that should be pretty cool. Our very own Omar here has uh, his Thanos uh, model posted over at Sci-Fi Fantasy for the uh, Model of the Year contest, and you can see that's a beautiful job he did on that. Just awesome looking colors and everything, nice detail on the face. Omar's a fantastic builder, and he's always really busy. Greg Byron doing the uh, Bane figure from uh, one of the Batman movies. Lee Chambers um, Halloween group built entry this year is going to be this awesome looking kit called the Harbinger of Death. Looks pretty creepy to me. Certainly suit suitable for Halloween and you can just tell by looking at this kit uh, the incredible uh, opportunity for all the detail painting on that. And I'm sure with Lee, again, there'll be some uh, really cool lighting effects on this. Look at how beautiful that kit is when it's built out, guys. Awesome looking kit. Wow, the detail on that horse with the veins and everything. Just awesome.
Okay, guys, I think that's going to be it for our update on the... Um, let me switch cameras again here. And uh, go back to... Well, that's our update for what's going on in the community uh, for this, uh, this month. And uh, it's really great to see that. Keep up the good work, guys. A lot of fun stuff going on there. And a reminder to everybody else out there for our Halloween group build this year. You've still got plenty of time to get in. Um, even if you're not a member of our group, you can just uh, post your, come over there and post some pictures. And uh, we'd be glad to see that. And, of course, I think Kenny and a few of the other guys have said that you can... Uh, you can, uh, you know, you don't have to build multiple models, models, because Kenny at Sci-Fi Fantasy has got a Halloween group build going on. I wanted to mention that, and then Kenny at Mindless Model Works as well. So, I think you can use the same kit for all the different group builds and just post your stuff over there, and uh, make sure you participate. So it's a lot of fun, and it looks like we're getting a bigger and bigger turnout. We're getting more people involved. It's closer we get to Halloween, so it's nice to see that. Okay, guys, I think uh, that's all my notes I had and everything. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back with the first thing on the bench tonight, and that's going to be uh, a look at the uh, 1350 scale USS Indianapolis, and then we're going to come back after that and do our work on our soundboard. So stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. See you in just a couple seconds. Back with you again, everyone, and um, here is the Academy 1350 scale USS Indianapolis. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, some big news the last couple of weeks. They discovered the wreckage of this kit on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean in about 18,000 feet of water. Can you imagine that? And uh, what was amazing they, is that they posted some uh, still pictures of the wreckage, and uh, the ship appears to be... Uh, Although broken up in some ways, the uh, basic parts that they've been looking at are in amazingly good condition. There were some pictures on there of the uh, one of the main gun emplacements here. She had uh, these 8-inch guns. That that uh, turret was completely intact and all the paint was on it. You could still totally see the gray color. Maybe just a little bit of silt on the top of it. But, uh, just amazing being underneath the salt water for that amount of time. You know, 80 years and still being... Uh, painted and not completely rusted away so uh, shortly here we can look forward to the video that I talked about of the uh, underwater tour of the wreckage and they're going to talk a little bit about the history of the ship this the ship has some amazing history behind it starting off with uh, being the fleet uh, kind of the fleet uh, presidential ship Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, before the war even started in World War II this was the ship that he used as his personal ship to travel around the world on because it was the fastest ship in the fleet 
In fact, she was so fast that uh, she held so, uh, many, many speed records. And uh, I think to this day it still holds the speed record for uh, traveling between California and Hawaii. Uh, and, and it was just an incredibly fast ship. So because of that speed, she was chosen to uh, for, a, for a historic mission in World War II. Right at the end of the war, this ship was chosen to deliver some major components of the first atomic bomb. And so, you know, that's the kind of the history behind this ship. It uh, delivered the bomb on time, and then on its way back, it was unfortunately uh, met and torpedoed by a Japanese submarine and sunk. And then you had this uh, uh, other sort of dark uh, thing in history that the ship is uh, remembered for, and that's the uh, fact that the crew uh, that survived the initial attack were in the water for several days and, and uh, being attacked by sharks and all that. And I think that unfortunately holds the record for the largest human shark attack in recorded history uh, the amount of people that were lost and everything they were finally rescued uh, you know several days later and I can't remember the exact numbers but I think only around 300 people survived of a crew of over a thousand so uh, pretty big uh, important part of history and I'm all you know I'm a big history buff and especially World War II buff so being that they uh, recently discovered the ship I thought it'd be a nice little tribute to build this kit I've always loved the look of this ship it's a heavy cruiser class Portland class cruiser from World War II I think she only had one sister I don't think there were uh, any more than that of these particular designs and uh, so it, she's got some really beautiful lines on her and again she was really fast and uh, just a gorgeous ship so let's take a look at the kit itself now now this kit doesn't come with any photo etch or any extra parts, so it's just basically straight out of the box. And you can see when you open it up, you get this really nice full color uh, picture of the the actual assembled model. So you get some nice uh, reference for your painting. Um, this is the way she appeared as she last appeared in uh, July. I think she was sunk on July 29th, 1944. And um, so she. Um, had this sort of two-tone gray color and then you know of course the anti-following color on the bottom and then the upper decks were all painted in like a dark navy gray so they're you know they painted over all the teak uh, decking on it um, on this particular ship was which is kind of unusual but it looked really nice so we pull this out of the way and we'll uh, have a look at our actual parts now I haven't taken any of this stuff out of the bags yet so but uh, a lot of these uh, scale model ships now are coming with what they call the waterline option so that you can either have the lower half of the hull installed on the model or not or if you're gonna mount this on a base and you just want to have it look like it's in the water you know at the waterline you have the option of doing that uh, or if you're gonna do a diorama with you know your simulated water using some silicone or something like that you can uh, have the option of doing that and not have to bury it so far down into the uh, you know you don't have to put the silicone that thick which is nice. Uh, we'll pull out the, the uh, upper part of the main hull here and show that to you. Um, it might be better if I turn this light off. Yeah, we can see the detail a little bit better on here. Um, you've got the, uh, you know, some basic plating there on the sides of the hull. All these poor holes, which on these builds, whenever I do them, I always go ahead and drill these all out. I think that looks a little bit nicer. Um, and they're all pretty much in place there mold looks to be uh, pretty clean and everything don't have a lot of flash or anything going on they're using that new what they call side pull mold technology um, on these kits so the parts turn out a lot cleaner than back in the old days we'll have a look at the bottom half of the hull here next which they do give you painted in this uh, supposed to be the anti-fouling color but uh, you know it's got a few little swirl marks in it here and there um, so my option is going to be to paint over this and get rid of all that and then of course, you know, do a little bit of weathering on it, dull coat it and all that, but it's a nice piece and uh, let's test fit it on here just for fun and see how good it fits. Looks like it fits snug as a bug to me. Can't even, can't even see the seam in there. A little bit of glue, that's going to be perfect. So... We're getting, we're getting some really nice model kits nowadays. They've just improved so much uh, from what they were in the 70s and 80s and all that. It's still fun to go back and build those classic kits, but uh, modelers are a little bit more demanding these days, so 
companies have stepped up in a lot of ways to improve on that give us better detail and more accuracy and everything let's have a look at the second screw here which is going to be our our decking got the four deck here in the quarter and after deck um, and there is some uh, planking detail here at the forward section um, but again this has been painted over on the version of the ship that we're going to be doing so I'll be doing that and then uh, you've got all your superstructure detail here uh, you got some railings some uh, masts just trying to identify some of this stuff some gun tubs and uh, just various parts of the upper superstructure some cabin detail and all that but the molds are really nice and clean don't see anything broken or anything on it I was able to pick this kit up off of eBay for about 45 bucks uh, from Omni Models and it was uh, I think it was about seven dollars for shipping so not a bad price for a 350 scale kit either here's part of the uh, more of the superstructure here some of the cabin detail get that a little closer here for you maybe you can check that out some nice detail portholes and stuff on the sides some hatchways so typical what you'd see on a kit like this Let's dig a little further in here another big bag of parts you can see the main she had a really oversized uh, crane just mounted basically amidships and it gave her a really distinctive look you could definitely tell what she was from far away which unfortunately the uh, guy looking through the periscope in the Japanese Japanese submarine that night probably immediately identified who she was too but uh, here we have some more decking uh, some of the upper deck works here with some of the quad 40 millimeter Bofors guns emplacements uh, just a uh, cabin detail more gun tubs the smokestacks and uh, here we have that big crane I was talking about so all of it looks really good then we've got another sprue here with some black parts details which looks to be parts of the base and the propellers and some other things I'm not gonna go crazy on this kit like I did on the Bismarck and the hood I'm gonna I'm gonna build this model 100% right out of the box no photo etch um, just a fun build and uh, I've seen videos online of this kit built up and it looks great right out of the box just do a nice paint job on it and you're all set this one's being stubborn here here we go all right yeah we got a nice uh, name plaque there USS Indianapolis CA 35 um, the stand on this model lacks a little bit to be desired I will say that these are the bases for it and you got two little pegs that go up into the bottom of the hull and as you can see that's a pretty narrow footprint I would think that that would uh, be able to tip over pretty easy so I'm definitely gonna improve on that I'll go to Hobby Lobby or Michaels and get a wooden base and stain it or something and do up this uh, plaque um, in like brass or, or you know gold or something like that and then put that on there and secure the model to that I'm not too happy with the stand but you know at least they do give you a stand sometimes they don't give you a stand at all so I guess we're, we should be happy with that so um, you have that and then we have all these uh, other parts here we have the propellers the smokestack details the rudder uh, just a whole bunch of small stuff like the little gun emplacements 50 caliber guns a uh, bunch of deck tie downs and bollards and stuff like that just all the small little detail parts that go on the grills for the top of the stacks there kind of hard to see that with all the clutter in the background but uh, yep like I said everything looks really good as far as the molds now we have the final couple of sprues here which are looks like the parts for the main gun turrets I think she had uh, she had three main batteries which were um, eight inch guns three barrels each for a total of nine so as for a heavy cruiser she was pretty formidable as far as armament and she had a really 
strong anti-aircraft defense system on it, which explains why she survived several kamikaze attacks during the war. Um, but you can see we've got all the uh, main turrets. Uh, we've got some more crane detail, the catapults. She did have a seaplane on board. I'm not sure what kind of... It might have been a kingfisher. I'll have to look that up and see what kind of a plane it was. Um, here's our Bofors uh, quad uh, anti-aircraft gun set up. Some 50 calibers, a bunch of life rafts. Again, I'll put my hand in front of these so you can kind of make these out. But uh, lots of detail there. And then this last sprue here is um, pretty much a repeat of that other one. So there you go, guys. There's all the main parts. Uh, decals included are pretty basic. You do get the uh, number 35 that goes on the hull and some flags and some markings for the seaplane, it looks like. You can see that there. Pretty, pretty uh, basic, but I'm glad they did include it. And then we have our parts identification sheet, some painting guides here, decal placement guides for the airplane, stuff that goes on the ship. And yeah, here's our, your sprue identification and all that. And we'll have a look at the instructions real quick. Just uh, straightforward. Like most ships, you're starting off with the hull, and then you're moving on up into the superstructure. Paint callouts along the way. Building the catapults, the seaplane. I guess this is a fold out and not a booklet here. Yeah, so there we go. Getting up into the main masts and some more superstructure. As with normal on these ships, it's all the details in the superstructure. And then we got the final steps here. Um, one thing that I notice is that there's um, not much reference to any kind of rigging, but you should be able to find some pictures of the ship or maybe blueprints or something like that to give you an idea of, uh, you know, to do some rigging on it, which is something I always like to do, you know. Uh, I just try to put, you know, the kind of the main rigging on these models. You know, you can go crazy and put all the tiny stuff on there, but I think it sometimes starts looking too crowded on a model that's, uh, you know, small scale like this. Uh, it's up to the builder's choice, and you don't have to put any rigging at all if you don't want to either, but uh, that easy line that they have out there works really nice for doing rigging. It's got that stretchability, and it looks the correct scale for these size ships. So there you go. There's the um, basic uh, decals, and you got your color callouts here. Steel, hull red, gold, deck blue, flat white, flat black, white, blue. Silver, navy, I'm, sh I'm trying to see. Uh, okay, they're using, uh, for reference, Mr. Color, Life Color, Humbrol, Testers, Ravel, or Vallejo. So it's nice that they included all the uh, paint manufacturers and what their particular codes are. Uh, sometimes you get that and sometimes you don't. Uh, so I've been really liking those Life Color paints, so I'm going to try to probably pick up this set that's uh, needed for this ship. Okay, guys, well, there we have it. Another um, open box kit review for you of the USS Indianapolis in 1350 scale by Academy. Nice kit. Really uh, looking forward to building it and uh, learning some more about the history of this ship. And I can't wait to see the uh, documentary that's going to be coming out shortly. You want to look for that on YouTube if you're interested in this. You just look up Paul Allen's YouTube channel. He's done several of these so far. He did a really great... Um, exploratory video of both the Masashi and the Yamato famous uh, Japanese World War II battleships when they were discovered so should be pretty nice you know, all in high definition so you can look forward to that coming up shortly all right we're gonna call this one a wrap guys I'll come back here we'll take a break and uh, we'll get set up on the bench again and start working on the uh, soundboard and show you guys how to uh, find sound files, convert them, and load them onto the sound card, and then uh, modify the sound card to uh, produce lighting effects while you produce the sounds as well. So we'll be right back with that. Stay tuned, everybody.
Okay, well we're back with you again and we've got our uh, soundboard um, laying out on the bench here. Now these soundboards available from a company called Big Dogs uh, Greeting Cards. That's uh, not spelled like the normal word dog. It's D-A-W-G-S, Big Dogs. So you can go do a Google, Google search for BigDogsGreetingCards.com and you'll find that they have a wide selection of these things on there. And um, you'll see that uh, this particular one that I like to use most of the time is this five button, um, 120 second version. Well, I think it's more than 120 seconds. Well, basically if you use an eight bit ingestion rate, uh, you'll get an option as far as the quality of the sound bite that you wanna load onto this card. And I use eight bit because that's uh, pretty clear and it gives you the maximum uh, uh, you know, length of time. Now each, each of these boards does have a limit on the memory. This one is limited to around three minutes and 20 seconds of total sounds. Now you can either put one constant three minute, 20 long sound clip on there, or you can break it down into individual ones so they all activate separately with you know each push of these buttons. And then you can actually program this to set these up um, to have you know specific sound on say button one, button two, button three, button four. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second. So this is the board in its basic configuration when you get it. You will get this little adapter that comes with it when you order one of these. This plugs into this little mini USB port here on the side. And that allows you to either plug it directly into a USB slot on your computer or use a USB extension cord. And that'll be able to, uh, that's how you load the sound files onto this. Now, one thing I want to point out is that um, the software that they include, they'll give you a little link to their software download. And uh, the software that you get with this will not work on Windows 10. It will work on everything before Windows 10. But as they mentioned on there, it may be problematic on Windows 8, uh, but you may have to fiddle with it a little bit, but they say you can get it to work, but Windows 10, it definitely doesn't work. I use a Windows 7 operating system, so I have no problem at all. But um, so uh, you'll load their sound, uh, your, their software program on there, and then whenever you wanna do a install for sound effects on this, you just basically pull up the software on your screen and um, uh, once you got your files selected and everything you just uh, uh, load them on. And we're going to take you through that. We're going to go to the screen here in just a second and show you how to do all this. So uh, Now this board is uh, in its out-of-the-box configuration right now and after we show you the um, way that you load all the sound files onto this thing we're going to come back over here and on the bench and I'm going to show you a couple things. I'm going to show you how to modify this thing so that it can run on a nine volt power source instead of what we've got here, which is it's operating on these coin batteries you can see that it comes with. Um, they're pretty good in most applications, but um, I just have found in testing and, and playing with these for the last couple years that uh, they don't last very long. And especially if you're gonna add lighting onto this, if you're gonna run lighting along with the sound, they wear out pretty quick. And you know, coin batteries are a pain in the butt to get. They're not as easy to get as um, you know, you may go go up to your local uh, supermarket and they may have, you know, a 9-volt battery, uh, for example, but they probably don't have these. I mean, you can, I get these coin batteries at, like, drug stores and stuff like that, but, you're, you know, they don't have them everywhere, so um, I don't like using them that much. Uh, you know, if you're going to work with something where you just need a small little, if you've got a small little area and you can fit them in there, um, they work pretty good. Or if you're going to just have something really simple and you're not going to run it very often, they're okay. But if you're going to, you know, use it very much, I recommend either, um, you know, replacing it so you can do, a, you know, modifying it so you can do a 9-volt battery or so you can hook it up to a power supply, which is what I tend to do. Um, so, but we'll talk about that in a minute. What I'm going to do here now is I'm going to sit down and hopefully I don't screw this up. I'm going to um, take you over to um, the, uh, let's see, we're going to head over to YouTube here. And we're going to get on the, um, first of all, I want to go share my screen. Okay, so we're on YouTube. Okay, so what I've done here is I just basically did a search. Now, what you're going to do initially is you're going to want to find your sound files that you want to use. And uh, the sound files are... Um, um, you know available in a lot of places and so I just get a lot of them off of YouTube uh, you know if I find if I can find a little clip or something from uh, 
let's say, uh, for example, we're going to, just for an example here, we're going to do some classic Star Trek sound effects, right? So I just did uh, Star Trek TOS sound effects search in Google, and I popped up with this stuff right here, and you can see we've got some stuff going on. So if we clicked on this one, uh, TOS sound effects, we have some sound effects, okay? Um, sounds like it's the... Uh, uh, ambient bridge noise from the episode The Cage. So, you know, that sounded a little bit different than it did on um, the uh, later production version of Star Trek. But let's go down here and see if we can find like a phaser sound effect. Uh, let's see. Button key press sequence. But you can see there's all kinds of stuff that you can find, right? So I'm just kind of scrolling down here. And um, we got some computer sound effects. We got the red alert. Well, let's go with the red alert. That'll work for our purposes here. So we get the red alert. All right. So we got our red alert sound. Okay. I apologize if it's kind of loud. Okay. So I just paused that right there. So what we want to do now is we want to download this. And um, we, uh, I've, I've already taken this step, but whatever method that you're going to use, you go ahead and you download this and. Uh, so once you get to the download, um, get your video downloaded, you've got to edit it because you don't want to have the whole thing on there. You might only want a certain piece of it or something like that. And so to edit it, basically what you do is you go into, um, I use Windows Movie Maker, and I'll load that into Windows Movie Maker. And then I will, uh, you know, use my editing features in there to... Uh, get it to where uh, I've got it narrowed down to just that particular sound. Now, the good thing about that is, is using Windows Movie Maker 2, you can look at the, the time counter on it so you can see exactly how long the clip is. And if you're going to do several uh, sound effects on your sound, sound card, you want to make sure you keep track of all those because you can't go over more than 3 minutes and 20 seconds worth of total time. So let's see, that's uh, 180. Uh, let's see, 120, 180 is 3 minutes. So... Um, it's, uh, well, you, you do the math, it's like two minutes, 240 seconds or something like that is three minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, so you, you want to make sure you don't go over that because if you try to load it on the sound card, it just won't load. It'll keep giving you an error. you got to be underneath of the uh, limit. Now, you can lower the bit rate. You'll see you're going to have some options on the bit rate um, so that you, um, uh, you can fit more uh, sound on there, but if... If it's just basic sound effects like this red alert or maybe the phaser firing or something like that, I would say you could lower it and it'll still sound okay. But if you have voices and talking and music, if you lower that down, it starts sounding kind of distorted. So, you know, all this, uh, when you start playing with this stuff, it'll all um, start making sense to you when you, uh, you know, experiment with it a little bit. And you'll just have to figure out some of those things yourself. I'm just trying to give you some of the basic concepts here. So, okay, so we got... Um, we got that. We got our file downloaded. Okay. So um, then what we're going to want to do here is I'm going to take this down here and show you um, that we have this little program up here called Gold Wave. All right. This is a program that I use, which is a free software program that you can download. And it's working, it's with working with sound files. So we've got our, we've got it shrunken down now. We've got our specific files saved that we want to save. Uh, from Movie Maker, and uh, we've created a video file out of it. Even though it's a video file, this uh, this program will still pick it up. You can still load it in there, and um, it will um, it will con it, you know will convert it to an audio only file. So we'll basically go up here and click on this up at the left, and then open the file, um, and then it, you'll see it in here, and it'll appear as a you know like a bunch of wave you know like a sound wave kind of thing. And then you've got some options up here as far as playing around with like the effect. You can, um, you know, you can you can change like the uh, the overall volume of it. You can change. It's got an equalizer, so you can raise or lower the bass, the treble, you know, all that stuff. Once you get it where you like it, you just click save. You go up in here and click save as, and then you're gonna see a secondary screen pop up. I don't have a file loaded in here right now, so it's not gonna work. But you'll see a secondary screen pop up over here in the right. And it'll ask you where you want to save it, number one, so you know what directory you're putting it in. And then number two, you want to save it as a WAV file, okay? That's really important because uh, WAV files are what you have to load onto the sound card. So once you have the WAV file saved, and you, you know what directory it's in, you close all this out, and you go in there, and you basically have your file, okay? So you're done with all that part of it. 
Now what we're going to do is I'm going to you'll hear the sound of it here. I'm going to I'm going to plug in the uh, USB jack onto the sound card. All right. And um, we're going to show you this little screen right here. This is the software that the sound card uh, uses and you can see that uh, you have these options here. I usually don't pay any attention to any of this stuff over here. I don't use any of this stuff. But you've got your sampling rate here options. And you can go all the way up to 16K. Keep in mind that if you use 16K, which is, uh, there you go, it says 209 seconds can be uh, downloaded uh, at 8K. Let's see if it changes if I hit 6. Yeah, 279. Okay, you can see the difference here, 167. At 12 hertz, only 139. And at 16, only 104 seconds. So, um, you have your options there. So, you have to keep that in mind, whatever, your, you know, bit rate you're going to, uh, use. So then you've got this all set, right? So then you can um, come in here and you can just click add the file. So you'll go to your directory, you'll find where you've got the um, uh, sound file that you just created. And now keep in mind that uh, the first file that you add, so you'll find that and you'll click add file. It'll show up on the screen there at the top. And um, that will be the first sound. Okay, if you just do only that one file, that's the only sound that will be on the entire board, all right? So if you're, if you're doing one long sound uh, dialogue thing or a clip from a movie or something like that, uh, and it's, you know, you've got it to pretty much almost the max length and uh, memory that this thing holds, then you're only going to use one button. So uh, that's all you'll need. Now, if you want to do multiple buttons and use all five buttons and separate five different sounds on here, keep in mind that the first file that you load on here is always going to be for button number one and then button two and then button three and button four and button five in that order so just keep that in mind um, and then once you get them all loaded in there you just click the right button and then this will start to work it will uh... it'll take a couple seconds depending on your computer speed and it will load the files on there it'll, it'll, it'll say uh... successfully programmed and then just test one of the buttons on the soundboard while it's plugged in just push one or two of them and see if your sound works and then what you want to do at that point right there is listen to see how loud it is. Now, a lot of times um, uh, I have to boost the level of the sound to get it to come out loud enough. And to do that, when you're creating the file back in that Gold Wave program that we showed you to begin with, I'm going to go back over to that and close this back out. Go back over here to Gold Wave. When you're creating the file, okay, so if you didn't like the, if, you, if it wasn't loud enough, your first file that you put in and it wasn't loud enough, you just go back over here to Gold Wave, open that file again. This time it'll be a WAV file that you created. Open it up and then go over to your effects here and then click volume and then um, click change volume. And then you have the ability to raise the volume up. And you'll see when, once you do that that the little squibbly lines there on the top of the screen that you know show the, the uh, sound wave pattern there will get larger. And you just keep playing around with that until you get it loud enough where you like it but it's not starting to distort because if you put it too loud it will distort like crazy when you play it back and again that's just something that you're going to have to uh, fool around with and experiment with until you get it to where you like it then once you get that to where you like it uh, go back up over here and hit save as and then uh, direct it to the same directory you did before and then it'll ask you to do you want to overwrite that old file then click yes and then click save and you're done then you can go back and start this process again load it back onto the sound card, test it again, um, listen to what it sounds like. Okay, so that's basically it. Now you get all five of them on there, or the single one that you want, and you're all set. You've got your sound uh, files on there, and it'll play whatever you've installed on there. Now, like I said, there's all kinds of places you can find um, um, sound clips. You can find them on YouTube. You can find clips from movies or whatever. If you, don't, if you can't find it on YouTube, what I'll do is I'll uh, get a DVD, and I'll bring it out here and put it in my computer and I'll uh, uh, run the DVD through and I'll make a copy of the audio files on there using whatever software you have for copying DVDs and then uh, put that in Windows Movie Maker and um, edit out the parts you don't want and, and keep the parts you want, you know, shrink it all down and then just repeat the whole process that I explained here. Move it over to Gold Wave, create it into a WAV file and, you know, of course you want to name each file what it is, like I'll call it uh, Star Trek TOS phaser firing or something, or Star Trek TOS photon torpedo firing, okay? And then uh, that way you know where they are. Then put them all in a little folder so you can save them for later or do something, you know. Uh, if you're never going to use them again, you don't need to worry about it. But, you know, I, 
I sell these boards and everything, so I keep all these files, and I have a whole library of different sound effects and everything. So I have the Seaview ones and a whole bunch of other ones. But that's basically it. Okay, so now I'm going to take you um, back to the bench, and um, we're going to show you. I'm going to unplug it right here. We're going to show you a basic um, modification on this now. Um, go ahead and warm up my solder iron. Uh, we're going to convert this so that it will run on 9 volts. And first I've got to grab one of these little, um, get one out here. Got my little bag of these. The key component to converting this is a transistor. And you can find these transistors for literally like 20 cents a piece. Okay. And uh, I'll show you a close-up of it here. You can get these off of eBay, and uh, I think Jerry at HDA Model Works carries them, too. Um, this is what they call an L7805 transistor. So basically all it is is it's a voltage reducer. And uh, so it'll take any kind of input voltage up to, like, 35 volts DC, okay, and convert it down to where it only puts out 5 volts. 5 volts only. It's not adjustable. All right, so it's a static... Uh, transistor and now these particular boards like to run it right at 5 volts if you run them anything higher I should have stopped back up a second and explain that why you may ask why can't you just hook up 9 volts directly to this and run it well they're running these three coin batteries here which are 1.5 volts a piece so they're 4.5 volts in total and uh, in testing here I did a sacrificial lamb there at the very beginning when I started to sell these things and I found out that just a shade over 5 volts it fried. It just basically couldn't handle it and it fried. So I realized pretty quickly that I had to have like a 5 volt uh, power source for this and that's kind of unusual. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I was using these for I run on a 9 volt system so I wanted to be able to run a 9 volt power source to my lighting and everything on my model and I wanted to be able to power this at the same time without you know, a separate power source. So uh, this works out ideal because I can put 9 volts input into this and get 5 volts out. Okay. So now we're going to explain how to hook this up. First, we're going to modify the board itself to get that to work. A couple things you got to do here. This is your power uh, power source here. This is the plus side all the way where this little. I'm going to hold this close so you can see this. There's this kind of little clip thing here on the side. It's got kind of a spring thing on there. That's the plus side, and this far battery over here to the left, that's facing down, is the negative side. So that's your plus and your minus for your input. I had to do a little testing to figure all that out too, but I figured it out, and that's what it is. So we're going to go ahead and remove the batteries first. And the good thing about this is if you've got anything else around the house that uses these kind of batteries, you save them and you can use them for that. Uh, so there's a little metal tab you got to bend up, and then they just kind of push out from the side there. It's kind of tough to get them out of there, but they do come out. Just get them out of there and put them off to the side. I'm using a little pair of tweezers here to do that. You'll see that there's kind of some gaps here where you got to work with to see which, you know, the best way to push it. But the main thing is to get this metal tab bent up out of the way and that kind of releases it. All right, we got that one out. We got one more to go here. I am finding that some of the, you know, due to these things sitting on the shelf for a while, I imagine that Half the time when you get them, the batteries are already dead or just about dead, and it only works a few times, and, and that can fool you too. The um, you want to going back up for a second here when you're testing the sound level on this to begin with, test it while you've got it hooked up to your USB cord because at that point the USB is powering it, not the batteries, because uh, it can fool you because you can say, okay, gee, it sounds you know, if you're testing it on the batteries, you're like, gee, it sounds kind of quiet. I can barely hear it. I'm going to have to boost up my sound car, you know, my sound file like we showed you there. Well, it could be because the batteries are just about dead. The first thing it's going to do is when the batteries start getting low, is it's going to start getting quieter. It's not going to be as loud as it should be. And that'll, you know, if you don't test it on a constant power source that you know is good, that could fool you. So keep that in mind too. So, all right, we've got that done. We've got the batteries removed. So I'm going to, uh, now I'm going to take and get rid of this little battery cover here um, so I can solder to this little lead that's, you know, this little connector that's underneath of it. So I just take a pair of side cutters, and I really carefully get along that tab right there, and I cut that one, fold it up, get my side cutters in there, and cut that one off. 
And now we've got this exposed terminal here, all right, which we can solder to. That's our negative side. And then over here on this other side, I just kind of bend this spring up out of the way. And the only thing that seems to like to cut that very well is my good pair of scissors here. So I'll, I'll cut that if I can here. Get in there close enough. Cut that off. And I want to make sure I... Uh, take a pair of needle nose and I'll just kind of bend that tab down and lay it flat so it doesn't cut me or anything. It's a it's a sharp little tab there once you cut that off. You don't have to cut that off there. You can lift it up and solder your wire underneath there if you want to, but I just cut it off. Okay, so we've got our, our terminals exposed now. Uh, plus on this side, minus over here. So we're ready to go, but now we've got to take our, our transistor and... Um, get that ready to go. So holding this up close you can see you've got three terminals on it. Now it's going to be a little hard to show you this on camera because it's always backwards but the farthest terminal if you're looking at it with the heat sink facing up and the transistor facing up and not upside down like this where you're seeing the bottom side of it facing up like this and the trans or the you know the heat sink part of it up on the top. The farthest terminal to the left is your red or plus power input okay the farthest terminal on the right is the red or plus power output in other words the input you can bring in as much as 30 volts DC but on the output you're gonna get a constant 5 volts always it's never gonna change no matter what input you're putting in keep in mind that uh, the more voltage you bring into this thing the hotter it will get now I've been running I've tested it tested it running at either you know 12 or 9 volts and it doesn't get hot at all and I'm never going to go above that. That's what I use typically for uh, all my model builds for my power sources, you know, for my LEDs and everything. So I'm never going to go above that. But if you did have some kind of weird power supply or something that you needed to go higher than that, it'll work. But just keep in mind that you, this thing might get a little bit hot. So mount it somewhere accordingly uh, where, you know, you're not going to have to worry about anything behind it melting or anything like that. So that's something to think about too. Now the center terminal is the ground. And the ground, um, it's a common ground. So for our input power, we need plus and minus, right? So we take our input power uh, plus that goes to the far left terminal, and the input power minus goes to the center terminal. And so for our output, which is our 5 volts, we'll have the far right, which is our plus, coming out. And also the center one is our ground coming out. The ground line is not affected, you know, voltage-wise. It will, it will not change. It will still be 5 volts over here. All right, so what I like to do is these things are a little long, so I'll just cut these off, these little extra legs here, and leave it to where it's just got these little three legs like that. Now I'm going to get out my handy-dandy little helping hands here and clamp it in place. Got it set up like that. Very first thing I want to do is, um, is tin those terminals with some solder. Got my solder iron warmed up here, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that using some regular... 60-40 rosin core solder. Don't need to use any flux or anything like that. Just uh, all it takes is a little bit, a little dab on there. Get just a little solder built up on each one of these legs. Okay. And just get the center one here. Now, Something very important that I'm going to mention right here. After you've soldered that or tinned it, inspect it really close to make sure that you do not have any solder that got on there too thick and that you're making a connection between any of these legs. In other words, you know, it got thick and it's laying off to the side or something and it's touching the terminal adjacent to one or another. That's immediate fry time if you, if you turn this thing on. It'll, it'll immediately burn it up. So keep that in mind. All right. Now, we're going to take some of our 30 gauge wrapping wire that I use all the time and we're going to uh, cut off a length here and we're just going to strip it. This stuff is easily strippable. Just take my fingernails and pull off a little piece maybe about an eighth of an inch long and uh, I'm going to pre-tin this wire just with a little bit of solder. Okay, got just a little bit of solder on there and then I'm going to uh, solder this red wire onto our very first terminal here, which is our input power, the one on the far left. Give that a 
a second to take hold. And then whenever you solder everything, you know, like I've, I've mentioned a hundred times, always give it a little bit of a tug to make sure it's on there good. It's not going to fall off. All right, we got that one. We'll go ahead and uh, make up our our ground for our center terminal. Now, as I mentioned, you got the you got the ground in and the ground out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two wires and put them together first. All right, just uh, strip them both. Same length, about an eighth of an inch or so. Get this other one ready to go. And then we'll go ahead and just twist these together, the bare wires. Okay. Now we'll tin this. Alright. Now I've got a just a tiny little bit too long, so I'm just gonna clip off a little bit of that. You don't want to have excess wire on there that could, you know, stick out or get crooked or something and touch one of those other terminals. You definitely don't want to do that. All right. So now we're going to just solder that onto the uh, center terminal. Give that a good tug. Make sure we're good there. Looks like we're good there. So we're just about done. Now all we got to do is get our red wire here for the final output terminal on the far right. Got a little solder sticking up on this one. I'll smooth that out. Okay. And we're going to tin this wire again. Shorten it up a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and solder that one on. All right. Okay. So we've got those all on there. Now, the final step for this, I'm going to uh, grab some heat shrink tubing. And we're going to protect our terminals with some uh, insulation so they can't short out now. All right, so I'm just going to cut three little equal, equal lengths of uh, heat shrink tubing. And we'll just slide those over our wires. All right, get that all the way up on there nice and tight. Our middle one here, we got two wires on that. You can see this is pretty simple to do. It's not hard at all. Just take your time and pay attention to your wiring. All right, now we've got all of them on there, so I'm going to take and uh, I just got. I keep one of these. These are really handy, guys. These um, uh, fireplace lighters or barbecue grill lighters. I keep one of these out here because it's great for doing heat shrink tubing or heat shrink. You know, just a quick little blast, and we're all squared away here. All right, give those a second to set up. All right, so we're done with our transistor now. Okay, so we just want to come back over here and strip these other ends of these wires. And before we connect it to our soundboard, we want to test this, all right, to make sure that it is operating correctly because we don't want to hook it up to our soundboard and fry it if we're not putting out the correct voltage. So let's do that. I've got my little uh, multimeter here. Another essential tool, guys. You can pick these up for like, you know, less than ten dollars. And if you're going to do, if you're going to learn how to do any kind of lighting and electronics work with models, you definitely want to get one of these and learn how to use it. It's very simple to learn how to use. It's just got a multi-selector switch here. 
we want to operate on DC voltage so I'm setting it to the 20 volt scale that'll show me anything from 0 to 20 volts I've got my power supply here so I'm set my power supply at 9 volts I'm gonna make sure I go to my input side here uh, you know I'm gonna tape this down so it doesn't move and accidentally touch something we don't we don't want it to practice safety folks all right we got that now um, we've got our input wire here our plus right so I'm gonna connect my plus wire for my power supply directly onto that and we've got our two wires which are grounds doesn't matter which one I'm used they both come from the same terminal so we're gonna connect our minus from our power supply onto that all right now we've got two wires left here which are our output that's that's what's going to connect to our board so this is what we want to test all right these over here I'm put another piece of tape down so they don't flop and touch something that we don't want them to touch okay power it up make sure my power supply is at 9 volts which it is now I'm going to test it with these little leads we should see right around 5 volts here okay we got to make sure we're making a good connection there sometimes it doesn't connect very well with uh, these clamps I'm using here I'm go through and check that Let's see what we get now. Red to red, black to black. And there we have it. We have 4.97 volts, okay? Or 4.94. So that's exactly what we want, all right? So we verified that that's working correctly. We can go ahead and get this stuff out of the way now shut off the power supply and we can connect it to the uh, to the board our sound board all right so I'm gonna bring that over here get our wires ready to go okay now I double check everything and make sure you don't get your wires mixed up I'm making sure I got my output wires not my inputs all right, and I'm gonna first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little solder on our terminals on the soundboard itself. So a little bit right here on the positive side. And a little bit here on the negative side. Get that soaked in real good. All right. Now we got our power output wire, which is our red. It's going to go to the plus side here, just run underneath of these two other wires. I'm going to solder that down on there. Give it a second to take hold. Okay, give it a good tug again, make sure it's on there good. And we're going to come over here and do the same thing on the negative side. Let's make a little coil out of the wire and it gives a nice good grip on that solder. All right. So now we're connected power wise on our board and we've got the main, um, the main setup here. So it's ready to work with a, a nine or 12 volt uh, power supply that would just connect directly to the input wires that we talked about on our transistor. You can mount the transistor, you know, in your base or wh wherever you're going to put it. And uh, so the power coming in from your your uh, wall wart or whatever kind of thing you're going to be using, you know, I usually use these little jacks that I mount on the back of my bases. And then uh, the red wire coming off of that and the black wire coming off of that connects directly to these. Now, the uh, 
you know, if you want to have the ability to switch it off and on, you just put a switch, interrupt the plus side or the minus side, whichever you want to do. Okay, so we've got that basic part of this figured out. It's in its raw format now. It's ready to work. We've got our sound. We can assume we've got our sound file loaded on there. And it's all set up and ready to go. So now what we want to do is we want to test it. Now, I haven't loaded any sound file on this yet, so it, it's going to play some Macarena music or something, whatever it comes preloaded with. But we want to test it now with our uh, power supply to make sure it's going to work. So I'm connecting the two wires again. power up look for smoke <laughs> if no smoke no smoke is good all right we're gonna hit one of the buttons I think I've got a bad connection again here like I said these clamps do not work too good on these small little wires here let's try it again I don't think I've got anything coming in guys this takes a little bit of fiddling around with we know it works because we just tested it. Strip a little bit more wire here, get a new bite on this and see what that does. Hmm understanding what the problem is here guys should have well when in doubt go back and make sure we are getting power to the board so I'll test that that way I can tell if my clamps are messed up here or if I'm Let's see if we get at the power at the board here yeah we're not getting any power to the board so I don't think we are yep we got four volts okay All right, there's one other thing it could be here. Oh, I see what it is, our wire. Um, yeah, let me explain that while I'm talking about this real quick, too. The solder connection uh, between the board and the speaker from the factory on these things is really, really lame. It's, uh, it, it's, if it doesn't work, that's probably why right there. And we can see what happened here. We got, we got a wire connection that came loose. So the reason our, it's not working is that we've got no sound getting to the speaker, so I'll just fix that really quick. Take in, um, I'm gonna have to put some heat shrink tubing on this. So, yeah, if your soundboard doesn't work when you get it, that's the first thing you want to check. I should have mentioned that at the very top. I've had that happen on a few of these. The uh, solder connection there, it's got some, uh, the wires are soldered onto the speaker and they've got a little bit of hot glue melted over the top of it. And, um, Sometimes it's it's just not just not a very good connection. Just all you need to do usually is uh, take a little bit of a dab of solder and just re-solder them real quick, and that'll usually take care of the problem. But let me get this straightened out here. Had me worried there for a second. All right. Get this wire put back together here. It's kind of small, so I gotta get in here really close. Hard to twist it together. Okay, let's get a little bit of solder on this. We want to power this down while we're working on it too. That's a good idea. Okay, let's test it once more. And there we go. Hopefully you guys can hear that, or hopefully not. <laughs> Some pretty pathetic music. Okay, so we got that, that situation taken care of. I'm just going to slide this heat shrink up over the top of this and seal this up real quick. All right. Now, there's one last little mod that we want to do if we want to add lights to this. Uh, and it's really simple. I'll try to explain it as best as I can. I'm going to power this back down. So, um, when this board works, it sends power to the speaker and produces sound. Well, it also sends enough power to light LEDs, okay? So, I'm going to grab a, just a basic, regular 5mm white LED um, and 
show you what we're talking about here. Um, hopefully I can make a connection through the... Uh, now let me melt a little bit of this. Like I said, it's got hot glue on the top of it, and it kind of messes everything up. All right, I got that cleared off. Hopefully that'll be enough. Um, so it sends just the right amount of power through there to light up an LED. And the key to this is that you do not, I repeat, do not want to use a resistor on the LED when you do this, because if you do, it's not going to work. Um, it, blocks, it blocks the current enough to where it, it won't light the LED. But it's the exact right amount of voltage where you don't need an LED for an LED, or a, you don't need a resistor on the LED. So it will never burn out. You know, it's, it's operating in its normal range without the resistor. So I'm assuming it's putting out like three point something volts uh, to the LEDs. Now, um, in, in all the different applications that I've used this for, I've hooked up as many as 15 LEDs on here, all in uh, parallel, in other words, uh, you know, two wires coming out and each connected to the uh, plus and minus of the LED. You don't want to wire them in series, okay? So uh, keep that in mind, just in parallel. So each each one, you got to have a you know wire going to it. So up to 15 of them, it'll light them all, you know. And, and so whenever it emits a sound, the LEDs light in unison with it. So it's kind of, you know, like uh, I guess example I could give you the, the latest one that I did here was the hex marks the spot when I did the thunder and lightning effects. Whenever the thunder sound happens, uh, the LED lights light up with it. All right. So you get a really cool effect. You can use your imagination. Uh, when the phasers fire, example, you could use a blue LED. It lights up in blue. Photons, red, you know, whatever you want to do. All kinds of different things. Red alert. You have a red, uh, red LED in your model, and whenever the red alert clacks and, you know, does its ring, this thing will light up with it in, in, in match sequence. Uh, now, if you've got, let's say, let's say you've got five different sounds on here, right? And a couple of the sounds, you don't want any lights. You just want to play the sounds, but you don't want lights to light up with it. Well, then what you got to do then is you got to wire in a switch. And um, I'll explain that really quick. Get you one of these little switches here. I get these little push button switches from Jerry at HD Model Works. Just these really simple little on off push button switches, two, two pole or single pole, two terminal. Okay. And it doesn't matter which side you interrupt. You can either interrupt the, the uh, minus side or the plus side. It doesn't matter each one. So. First, let me show you. Let's see if we can get uh, our LED to light. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna touch these terminals. Uh, make sure I'm on plus and minus here. If you get this backwards, it won't burn out. Unlike if you connect the board itself to the power backwards, it will burn out. But our output here, it, it will not hurt it if you accidentally get it wrong. But if you look really closely here, there's a. These terminals are marked on the speaker, but they're really hard to see. And right now the. This darn uh, hot glue has covered them up. There, I got them. I got some bare solder that I can see, and hopefully this will work. Okay, we don't want that wire to come off. Just wait for it to cool back down. Okay, so that should be all right. Let me test it again and make sure it still works. And it doesn't, so I lost my connection there. Like I said, these connections on here are really, really pathetic. There we go. So you probably want to work on that, you know, make sure yours is good. All right, so I can't really see the terminal thing on there, so I'm just going to try it both ways. I won't hurt anything. Just laying my... I'll try to keep this where you guys can see it, too. Put my LED on here. I'm going to hit the sound. Okay, you can see that lighting up in unison with that. Of course, my finger's in the way, so you can't see it. But take my word for it, it's working. I'll try to get you an angle where you can see this. One more time. Normally, I solder all this stuff up and don't have any problem. I'm trying to do a demo mode here for you guys, and it's getting a little bit difficult. Hold on a second here, guys. Let's try this. Maybe I reversed it. Well, I'm not sure what's going on here now. Unless I got some hot glue in the way again. Yeah, I can see that's exactly what it is. 
I hate that they put that hot glue on there. It drives me crazy. Okay. Let me try it once more. There it goes. Okay, so you can see it. It, uh, it it changes in frequency, you know, up and down, brighter and dimmer as the as the sound level increases and decreases. So that allows you to do some really cool, you know, special effects and things like that. And um, so that works great. Well, like I said, when you uh, don't want that to come on, what do you do? Because no matter what, every button you push, when it, as soon as it puts... If you have this connected direct on there like that, uh, no matter what, whenever you push the button and any sound comes out, it's going to light, right? So uh, what I'll do is I'll take a little switch like this, right? And I'll just, now normally I'll solder two extra wires on here, the same thing, these little, you know, 30 gauge wires, and I'll extend them off, leaving the other two wires, you know, connected onto the, uh, uh, onto the speaker there that come from the board. And then uh, those will go to my, uh, whatever my LED is going to be, you know, whether I've got it mounted in the model or, uh, you know, for example, like on the 350 Enterprise, I do those phaser uh, light up effects on the bottom of the secondary hull or on the bottom of the saucer. So that wire will come off of, like I'll have this sound card mounted in the base, that wire will come all the way off of there and go all the way up inside the model and all the way to the LEDs, wherever they are mounted inside, you know, so you got to, however you do that's totally up to you. Um, but so to, in order to have those where I can shut them off and on, I just interrupt it. Like I said, so like I'll take the plus wire and at some point I'll cut it. I'll attach one side of it to this terminal uh, that's coming off the soundboard and the other one goes on back up into where the, you know, wherever the LED is. So basically when the switch is off, the sound's still going to work here. It's still going to play and sound just fine, but it's not letting any juice get to that LED. You see what I mean? You just interrupted it. So now it's not going to light. So let's say my first two buttons on my soundboard are dialogue, but the third one is like the phaser sound effect, right? Well, when I go to push that button, I simply turn this button on first. Just click it and make sure it's turned on. Then when my sound plays, my lights light up, all right? Unfortunately, that's the only way you can do that with this type of a setup. It's not what they call an intelligent board where, you know, for example, if you went and got a... Um, uh, a board from Ralph. Ralph could set this up at tenant controls where he would have different outputs on here and certain ones would light up and certain ones wouldn't. Um, uh, and, and so that's another route. But this board is really cheap. You know, it's it's only uh, uh, 10 bucks or whatever. So, you know, you have an alternative. And then you got, you know, these multiple button effects you can, you can use. So just a different approach, you know, just a different way to look at it. Now, if you're not going to put any lights in it at all, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, okay? So, uh, and again, go back to the very beginning here. If you're going to put just one long sound effect on this and you only need one button, then you don't have to worry about all these individual buttons or anything. So, I hope I didn't get too complicated. I hope I explained it as clearly as I could. And sorry about the little issue we had with our wire here, but that's probably a good thing that that popped up because... Um, this can happen on these boards when you get them you know these come from China and uh, they get mass produced and and so you know every once in a while the quality control is not that great and the, you know you could have a bad solder connection but before you throw the board in the trash and say it doesn't work that's something that you want to check on this um, because it can happen so you just want to solder two wires onto the plus and minus here and bring them out and then that way you can go directly to your LED if you want it to light all the time whenever you whenever you're playing sound you're fine if you don't, you just interrupt it with one of these little switches. And, you know, there's all kinds of different on-off switches that you can use. I'm just using this one as an example. Whatever style you like to use or whatever, but just a really simple on-off switch is all you need. Okay? So, well, that's uh, all I've got for our on-the-bench section tonight. Uh, and I, and I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a regular uh, YouTube video of this and put that on my on my TrekWorks channel. And hopefully I'll uh, it won't be... Quite as disjointed as this kind of was and i'll put it out there so that everybody that was asking those questions will have a a guide uh for doing this and um you know even though i sell these you know for some people it's it's uh 
it's more convenient just to have somebody else do it or whatever but if you want to do this yourself this is how you do it okay so we're going to uh, take another quick break and we're going to come back and i will uh wrap things up for tonight we'll have our shout outs and our q a see you in just a couple seconds everybody Okay, everybody, back with you again, and I uh, hope we uh, explained that clear enough on our uh, soundboard setup. Like I said, I had a couple little unexpected glitches there, but um, I think we got the point across, and uh, if you guys have any questions about that, like I said, I'm going to make a, a regular YouTube video on that, I think, and just put that up there, and then if questions pop up about it, just put them on the video, and I'll be able to answer them for you. So hopefully you can uh, use that out there. That's a pretty nifty little setup, and it doesn't cost that much. That's kind of why I like using these. And they sound great once you get them all programmed. Um, you know, just the board by itself sitting on your bench is not going to sound very good because the speaker's just sitting there. But if you mount it in a nice little enclosure like a bass or, a, you know, something like that, they, they sound a whole lot better. So uh, for, for what they cost, I think they're pretty effective. Okay, time to head over to our uh, shout-outs and our Q&A for tonight. I'm going to roll up to the top and uh, see you all here. I was getting some kind of an error thing during the broadcast. Um, so I hope uh, the broadcast was good for you guys tonight. It, it looks okay on the picture there. It's giving me some kind of key error or something. I've never seen that one before, but hopefully it wasn't uh, buffering or anything. So, um, okay, we've got Star Siege Player, T Commando, uh, Ralph at Tenet Controls, Paul De Tomaso, Dadnator24, uh, Mike Mitchell, Phil with the Sprue Works, Mark Shu. Leona Timber Company, Luma Bear, uh, Outsider 238, Star Siege Player, Space Pirates Hobbies, Jacob Janosik, 2000 SPQR, Brian Knowles, Roger Ball, Murphy Peoples. Nice to see you, Murphy. Looking forward to seeing what you're doing this year. Uh, glad to see your daughter's taking part in the Halloween group build. That's going to be a lot of fun. Eric Hawkins, um, Jim Clark, Derek Sabera, Scale Model Kit Review. Hi, Steve. Nice to see you on with us tonight. Uh, Dennis, Federation Shipyard. Good evening, my friend. Uh, Kenny sci Fantasy is here with us tonight. Robert Morris. 
James Schulenberg, Rocket Boy 69. Modeler X, PJC 2.0. Red Shirt Forever. And Luma Bear. <laughs> yeah, I was panicking there, Luma Bear, but uh, you know, you just go to your instincts and try to think, okay, what could it be? Because we knew we had the power working there. Um, you said to figure out what it was. But like I said, it's a, it's almost a good thing that that popped up because I've had that happen before, and uh, that's what you want to do to troubleshoot that. So that board there, um, I worked on. I'm actually going to make up. I got a customer that ordered one. It's going to be the C View uh, soundboard. So we got to load our C View sound effects on that. That's why I didn't actually load a one of the regular sound effects on there. But it works really good. And um, so there you go. If anybody has any questions about anything we showed you tonight, go ahead and fire those up or questions about our community or anything or about the Halloween group build. As I mentioned, um, we're, uh, we've already kicked it off, but you've still got plenty of time. Um, and uh, you have until the 28th of October. Even if you don't get finished, guys, just uh, have some fun with it, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's just uh, something fun that we do every year, and it's... My favorite part is when I get to put together the slideshow and we get to show everybody's work all in one place. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of our modelers go all out on the Halloween build. It, it happens to be my favorite of the year. Um, you know, I'm still a kid at heart, so um, all, all the stuff from my childhood memories of Halloween and all that I like to, you know, and we've got all these wonderful kits out there now about all those different subjects from, for Halloween. So just use your imagination a little bit and join in on the fun. Some of the other group builds going out there, like I said, I plan on joining up on the uh, uh, cancer awareness build that Kenny's got going at Mindless Model Works. Um, you know, and a, and a few things like that. And um, there's always some kind of group activity build going on out there. <laughs> Big Rob, well, you're, you, you're just going to have to hit the rewind button, buddy. <laughs> Can't do it all over. Um, Again, I didn't see any feedback on that, but hopefully the, the video looked okay tonight. I'll have to look and see what that error was. Never seen that one pop up. Um, for the uh, cancer awareness build, I'm going to build a big rob. Well, you, you, Whoop. You're just going to have to turn the, the sound on. Button, buddy. Hang on a second. <laughs> and I'll show you the kit that I'm going to build for that. This is the um, AMT... 64 Dodge Belvedere. Um, it's uh, the Lawman. It's a famous race car from the 60s. Really nice kit. You can see by the box art here in the back. It's got all the decals and everything with it. Really detailed kit with the uh, all the engine detail and all that in there. So that's my, my selection for the um, cancer awareness build i'll have to look and see what color white represents or what cancer white represents or white and red or whatever but um make sure i get that right and then before i start building it i think on next week's show or next episode we're going to do an out of the box kit review on this kit for you guys it's a really really nice kit it's you know it's got all the extra goodies and everything in and they they finally i've been looking at this kit at hobby lobby for a while and they finally reduced the price on it so i went ahead and got one and uh it looks to be a nice kit. I'm not sure if it's a complete new remold or if it's a brand new kit. Some of you guys out there might know. Um, so that's that. Hopefully that'll answer that for you. Um, yeah, we've got Omar down there in Florida. I hope you're doing it. Well, he's on with us, so hopefully he's he's doing okay. Hasn't lost power, apparently, unless he's on his phone. Yeah, the storm seems to be hitting Florida pretty hard, so uh, we're thinking of everybody down there. Our, I know our, our other good friend Armando. I haven't heard from him. He just had a surgery here a couple days ago, so he'll be he'll be missing from action here for a little while. But uh, he was okay the other day. He came out of the surgery just fine. Yeah, Armando or Omar is on his iPhone. Yeah, um, 
I don't know if uh, some of you guys uh, saw that or not, but they're going to be uh, playing Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan on the big screen this week, um, either on the 10th or the 13th, at least in this area. I got my tickets. I'm going on the this Wednesday. going to show The Wrath of Khan director's cut in 4K, so I had to get tickets for that. Anybody watch um, The Orville tonight? Give us a little a quick little um, what they thought of it. I was kind of uh, looking forward to watching that. It looks, it looks uh, like a good mixture between you know a little bit of Star Trek or a tribute to Star Trek and some comedy. Yeah, he was a little bit sore, Omar, but he's he's doing good. Steve F., nice to see you with us here tonight. He says he's a longtime lurker, uh, but he's going to do a Halloween. He's going to participate in the Halloween group build, the Aurora Dracula. Well, that's certainly a classic. Can't can't wait to see that one. Thanks for joining in. Phil with the Spruik says, Orville was good. That's great. Glad to hear it, Phil. I'm hoping the show does good. I'm, uh, I, I recorded it, so I'm going to watch it a little bit later. Yeah, Seth MacFarlane is a genius comedy writer, so I'm sure uh, <laughs> they had some crazy stuff going on in there. I just saw the little clip uh, where he was sitting in the Admiral's office, and he gives him the ship, and he says, Mind if I have one of your candies? And he eats it or whatever, and he goes, Those are marbles, and he spits it back out. Crazy Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, Derek, I didn't expect the CGI to be, you know, top-notch in it. I, I don't think that that's what they're really going for on that show. I think they're, um, you know, just trying to give you the the idea of it or whatever. I don't think it's a huge budget show. Could get better as they go, too. They're probably kind of waiting to see. They're taking a real chance with that show, you know, a, a comedy in space. I mean, and it's it's definitely a satire of Star Trek, so it may take a little while. If it does well, you know, I'm sure the, the whole quality of the whole thing is... Uh, is going to get better. Uh, PJC, yeah, a glow in the dark model will still glow if if you if you just clear coat it. Sure. They do make glow in the dark paint, by the way. Um, a few years ago, I tried it and it wasn't that great. But from what I understand, there's some really good quality stuff out there now that glows for a long time and it's nice and bright. Looks like uh, Orville's getting some pretty good reviews. Ah, Grayson's on with us tonight. Nice to see you, Grayson. Yeah, she says she's watching um, Christine before she does her uh, paint job. There you go. That's definitely one of my favorite movies, for sure. It's on my Halloween must-watch list every year. I have a group of movies, like I'm sure a lot of people do, where I watch them every year for Halloween. Kind of change it up from year to year, but I always have a special few that I watch every year, and I save them just for that time of the year. There's lots of pictures online of Christine, too, Grayson, that you can find. Tons of pictures, good, clear pictures of how the car should look. Oh, I'm glad you could get on with us, Omar. Nice to see you're safe. Hopefully the damage isn't too bad down there, and it's just power lines and stuff like that. Hope it doesn't destroy a lot of buildings and everything. <laughs> yeah, the Great Pumpkin. Yep, that's a that's a must watch every year for Halloween. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the um, all the group builds this year. There's already a lot of nice. Um, Nice ones going on. Looks like the, uh, as I said there at the top, it looks like the Mike Myers kit's going to be the popular one this year. Last year it was the uh, that Headless Horseman kit. 
uh, PJC. I'm not sure. You can just you can go online and do a look. Um, I'm sure, uh, or you might want to ask right here. Um, some of the guys, if you saw PJ's question, he's asking what what is the best glow in the dark paint to use. I haven't used any since the paint I tried, uh, and I don't even remember what brand it was. It was five or six years ago when I built the uh, Defiant, and I wind up not using it and just leaving the model as is because uh, it glowed the best the way it was without any paint on it. The glow paint that I tried, it it, it wasn't very bright and it didn't last very long. But uh, from, I've seen some other guys out there lately that have been using paint, and it's been working out really good, they say. Space Pirates says he went to see Close Encounters. Yeah, they re-released re that one in the theater in 4K, too. That's pretty cool. Restored. I had to see Star Trek, that's for sure, and especially The Wrath of Khan. That's, I still think that's the best Star Trek movie. Uh, Clint Llewellyn's also do, uh, he's he's doing the creature from the Black Lagoon and the Headless Horseman. Cool, looking forward to that one too, Clint. So, Krylon glow in the dark is decent. Phil with the Sprue Works wants to know if there was ever a kit of the mother shit from Close Encounters. There probably was like a resin kit out there or something. You never know. I don't think I've ever seen a like like from AMT or anybody like that. I haven't seen one. That'd be a heck of a model to build with all I mean there's a there's a ton of detail and lighting on that thing. That model was also built by Jim Dow, who you guys have heard me talk about several times, who built the Enterprise refit for Star Trek the motion picture. He built that one and he also built the uh, Valley Forge that they used in uh, Silent Running, the old Bruce Dern one, you know, with the uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie robots, which is a great sci-fi movie. No, you can do as many as you want, Clint. In fact, the more the merrier. I'll be winding up with about four of them myself. I, I'm going to do... I got two of them done, one more to go, and then I'm going to do one for Kenny's uh, Mindless Model Works group build. That's the, uh, uh, or I already, or that's right, I did it, the, the pirate ship. But, uh, yeah, I got one over there, and I did, uh, I got one more to go here, the Strange Chains Vampires. Yes, yeah, so you can do as, as many as you want. Looking forward to it. sure I didn't miss anybody here if anybody's popping in on the uh... chat thing uh, let's see the I see the captain I don't know if I mentioned him or it could be a her Timothy Auger Yeah, I've had a lot of fun with all the kits I've worked on so far this year. They've all been nice little kits. I really, really like that Hex Marks the Spot kit. That was fun to work on. Yeah, T Commando, looking forward to that. Uh, he says he's going to be doing a scratch build for the... As we showed at the top of the show, he's going to do a Halloween... Uh, sea view with the ghost U-boat from that episode The Phantom. It's one of the best episodes of that whole TV series, by the way, if you haven't ever seen it. 
Captain Kruger, I think was the guy's name. He was a ghost. It's supposed to be a World War I German U-boat. Okay, Kenny's got to check out. We'll see you later, Kenny. Take care. John Hunt says he's got the Evil Dead Ash Kit. That's, that's one that I looked at. I was looking at that one. I love those movies. Uh, Model X, the board is uh, from... It, it, it doesn't really have a model number on it um, that I know of. But if you go over to that Big Dogs Sound and Greeting Cards website, that's www.bigdogs.com. As I explained, it's not spelled dogs. It's spelled D-A-W-G-S, like dogs. And uh, look for their five-button um, do-it-yourself kit, I think is what they call it, or something like that. But they have a whole bunch of different ones on there. You'll find it. They take, pay they take PayPal and all that, so you can order it. And it comes with that little jack that I showed you uh, right here. Adapter so you can lo uh, load your sound files onto it. That's right, I forgot about that space. Um, forgot Matt lives down in Florida too. I think he's up more north. I think he's up by Orlando. He's probably not going to get it as bad, but hopefully he'll be all right. Jim, that transi that transistor is an L7805. The O5 stands for the output voltage. I'll type that on here just so I'm clear. There you go. find those on eBay. Well, Jerry actually carries them, too. I, I should give Jerry a shout-out on that. He carries them. That's where I've been getting them from. I started off buying them on eBay. They're they're really cheap. They're like 20 cents a piece. Uh, the main thing about it, though, like I said, you want to pay really careful attention to uh, when you do that soldering on there like I did, because one little... If you hook it up reverse polarity, it's instantly popped. So... Make sure you pay attention to that. Be careful when you're wiring it. Other than that, it'll be fine. <clears throat> okay, folks. Well, I'm showing about 9 o'clock here, my time, so we're about two hours in. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'm sure some of you are starting to get sleepy out there, and uh, it's it's late for some of you that are watching overseas. So um, we will uh, be back a week from next week. So, you know, we're bi-weekly now, and uh, as we get closer to Halloween, I'll just keep giving everybody reminders about that. And then uh, uh, just, you know, everybody keep posting your work over there at the um, uh, Model Shop page. Uh, when, uh, I would like to ask everybody a favor too. Like, if you're if you're going to post your picture, if you, if it's your final pictures uh, of your model that you built for the Halloween group build, put that title on your on your pictures when you post it, so that I know that that's like your last shot of it. I want to make sure that I'm getting, um, you know, the last picture that you want to have on the slideshow, and try to get you know four or five pictures from a couple of different angles. That would be great. That way I can pick through them and try to get the one that looks best and uh or a couple of them that looks good and and um and i'll put them on the slideshow and we're going to broadcast that slideshow during our halloween special which is going to come at a weird uh it's halloween's on a tuesday this year so it's going to be like the, the last sunday before halloween i'll get that date on there and everything figured out um i'd like to broadcast it on halloween night but it's in the middle of the week i think it's on a tuesday night and that that would be pretty pretty hard to do for some people so um, we'll get everything sorted out and keep putting those updates on there guys like I said too, uh, plenty of time if you haven't joined in yet you got 
still almost about two months to finish it up. And uh, if you're worried about time, you know, just pick a really simple little kit. You don't have to go crazy and build a big diorama with lights and all that. Uh, just pick up a little simple kit like that. Maybe like that little pirate ship I did the other day. That's fine. Have some fun with it. So thanks for tuning in tonight, guys. Sorry about a couple of the little glitches on the soundboard tutorial, but I'll put a video of that up uh, on the channel and get that cleaned up. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, for those of you that watch the Trekworks channel, probably Monday or Tuesday I'll post the uh, final video of the Doomsday Machine diorama. I finally got my decals in here. Uh, from JT Graphics on that one, and uh, I'm working on that model tonight. So uh, all I had to do is finish putting the decals on the little constellation, and it'd be done. So we'll show you that one all finally wrapped up. Apologize for the delay, um, and then we'll move on to something else. Got that big Star Trek phaser rifle to work on. All right. So you guys take care. We'll see you next time. Till later. G good night and happy modeling, everyone.